So the topic which I have chosen is something a little bit more clinical, but at the same time, this is one thing which is now becoming almost the standard of care. So the acute stroke imaging, what the technologist needs to know, because uh, the technologist interact so closely with the radiology fraternity, uh, the technologist has got a lot of role in um, bringing the diagnosis at the same time in guiding the treatment also. So it is very important that you know the clinical aspects of stroke imaging and what are the latest things that are happening in the acute stroke imaging and intervention. So I will dwell a little bit on the clinical scenario and then the radiological scenario and what is the future of acute stroke imaging. Okay, so with this, I will start. So why is acute stroke imaging important? As you all know, stroke is nothing but any acute neurological event, either caused by a ischemia or hemorrhage, which causes focal neurological deficit. In India, stroke is the fourth leading cause of death. If you uh, go into the causes of death, the leading causes would be obviously myocardial infarction, cancers, the next will be the respiratory illness, and fourth, it is the stroke. Even if the patient does not die, the disability burden is huge. If you have a patient who has got a hemiplegia or hemiparesis, look at the enormous economic burden to the family. The patient will not be able to go to work. He needs a caretaker at home. So even if his wife is working, he needs his wife to take care of him because he's not able to move about even to the washroom. So that so so much of economic burden is also there because one patient suffers from a hemiplegia. So this is where the importance of early identification, early pickup of stroke and intervention is um, the important thing which I'm going to talk about. So this is epidemiology. Epidemiology means what is the burden of acute stroke in the community in India? 80% is, it is due to the ischemic stroke. Ischemic means any blood vessel that is blocked, that is an ischemic stroke. 20% is due to hemorrhage. The most cause of the hemorrhage would be a hypertension. And of the ischemic strokes, 40% are large vessel. I will tell you what is a large vessel occlusion. When I tell about the blood supply, I will tell what is a large vessel occlusion. And another thing is the recent treatment of stroke by giving an intravenous recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. So this is a substance which we give, which will go and dissolve the clots. It is just a small injection which we give intravenously, which will go and dissolve the clots. But when a large vessel is occluded, then only 30% open up. So we need to do some intervention also. And for that, imaging of acute stroke is very important. So what is the role of the uh, uh, the Department of Radiology. The role is that you need to do a prompt imaging and then consistently we need to pick up the early CT signs. Now the early CT signs, the technology is also very important because he's a person who is adjusting, uh, adjusting the windows and uh, putting the film. So it's very important that he picks up or at least makes it visible on the film. And there is something called the aspect score, which I will again tell you uh, later on. That is also important for you make it easier for the radiologist to give an aspect score. And the next is the large vessel occlusion. The large vessel occlusion is brought about when you are doing a CT angiographic study. I will just uh, on my pointer options. So a brief review of the basics. I will just go a brief into the physiology, pathophysiology, we will tell. So this is the brain vascular supply. As you all know, we have got an anterior circulation and a posterior circulation. What is anterior circulation? The anterior circulation is made up of the carotid arteries, the common carotid artery, which divides into the external, the internal. The internal goes into the uh, brain, uh, I mean, into the calvarium and there it divides into the middle cerebral artery. We call it MCA and then we it also divides into the ACA which is the anterior cerebral artery. Okay, 
and then there is a posterior circulation which is made up of the two vertebral arteries so the right and the left which go posteriorly it enters the foramen transversarium of the cervical vertebra goes inside the cranial cavity joins the right and the left joint to form the basilar artery the basilar artery divides into the posterior cerebral artery so you know that there is the anterior circulation is made up of the middle cerebral artery anterior cerebral artery posterior circulation is made up of the posterior cerebral artery basilar artery the vertebral arteries so what is a large vessel so large is anything from the for example from the internal carotid artery origin right up to the we call it a2 or m2 or p2 that is the first segment is m1 the second segment of the middle cerebral we call it m2 likewise the anterior cerebral artery the first few things we call a1 then a2 like the likewise for the posterior cerebral artery we got p1 p2 so up to the second segment of aca mca and the pca we call it as a uh, large vessel i will tell you why the importance of finding out the large vessel occlusion so what happens in a thrombogenic event there is a clot which forms why the clot forms because there is a so much of cholesterol plug within the blood vessel so when the cholesterol plug ulcerates the blood the platelets in the blood they come and attach to the cholesterol plug and a clot develops so an acute stroke develops so this is the pathophysiology of an ischemic stroke so the basis of stroke therapy is that there is a core which is totally dead that is called the irreversibly infarcted tissue but the around the core we have called something called the penumbra now this penumbra the blood supply is less but the neurons are still alive okay so this is what we need to find and we need to salvage okay many times the core will be a small core this whatever we do this is not going to come to life at all but we we can save the large penumbra and almost bring a dramatic recovery for the patient if we do everything fast so that is what i want to emphasize in this talk so acute stroke evaluation everybody will be tell me uh, we need mri or so on and so forth but i will tell you here if you are if you do a prompt plain ct brain and a ct of neck and brain and jo in an ordinary 16 slice ct you are set for saving the brain of the patient the other things if it if it if they are there it is well and good otherwise we can make do with these thing only thing is the patient should come within at least 2 hours of suffering the stroke if the patient comes even 4 hours 4.5 hours it's okay as early as possible if the patient comes and lands up at the ct center we have to do the ct brain and we can also follow it up in the same sitting with a ct neck and a ct brain angio these two studies if they are available well and good otherwise we should not waste time to shift the patient okay if the mri is available nearby we just do in the mri diffusion alone otherwise don't try to wait for an mri so what are we going to see we are going to assess the brain parenchyma very carefully and we also uh, uh, know uh, we also should assess the large intracranial blood vessels when we do a ct angio and we should know a basic section anatomy because future it is i will tell you in the later on the future it is always going to be a good technologist with an interventional radiologist diagnostic radiology is slowly being taken by artificial intelligence so everything depends on a wonderful technologist at the uh, place where the scan is done and an interventional radiologist who is at the cath lab the diagnostic radiology especially for emergencies is now slowly and slowly being taken over by artificial intelligence so what are the goals of imaging i uh, this is one popular acronym like we can tell the four p's what what is the four p stand for it stands for the brain parenchyma pipes it denotes the blood vessels the arteries perfusion is one study which we do in a ct scan by giving contrast that is a perfusion study and then the penumbra i told you know around the irreversibly infarcted core there is a ischemic penumbra so these are the four things which the radiologist or the technologist with the help of the artificial intelligence is going to find out 
So in the parenchyma, what we are seeing, rule out hemorrhage. If there is hemorrhage, absolutely it is conservative. Unless there is a large hemorrhage, when the neurosurgeon comes in, he opens the brain calvarium, uh, reduces the intracranial pressure, maybe tries to remove some part of the clot. Otherwise, it is only conservative. And then if there is an ischemic stroke, it is very important that we pick up early stroke signs. A lot of thing is in the technologist's hand by adjusting the windows and showing to the clinician or to the radiologist that there is in fact a stroke. And then by doing a prompt C2 angiogram, you can assess for intracranial and the extracranial thrombus and doing a perfusion wherever it is available. You can do a, you can find out, these are some, some of the short forms for cerebral blood volume, cerebral blood flow, mean transit time. I will tell you in my later uh, sections, in my later slides. And then penumbra, this is the most important thing. You assess whether there is salvageable brain tissue. So the first thing everybody knows, a normal gray matter has got around 40 H unit, a white matter has got 25 Hounsfield unit, whereas a hemorrhage has got a 80 plus Hounsfield unit. Very easy to tell. Even the first year BSC technologist or a DRDT student will pick it up. The moment you see this one, you can be rest assured you, there is no need to call the interventional radiologist team because it is going to be made, right? the management is going to be conservative. This is the common location for any hypertensive bleed. Whenever the BP raises, say for example, 200, 110, all these small arteries which supply the basal ganglia, this we call it as a basal ganglia, the caudate nucleus, the lentiform nucleus and the thalamus. So these are the basal ganglia. It's very common to have a hypertensive bleed here. The next is another thing called the aneurysmal bleed. Again, this is the completely different intervention we are going to do. The aneurysmal bleed, what happens when there is a, a saccular outpouchings of the um, arteries supplying the brain? Here in this uh, uh, case, it is a A1 segment of the anterior cerebral artery. You can see post contrast. You can see the aneurysmal sac, bilobed aneurysm. And because it has ruptured, you see a classical dissection of the hematoma into the brain parenchyma surrounded by edema on both sides. So this is a plain scan, this is a CT angio scan. Again, this patient also needs an interventional radiology, but not the stroke management. Okay, So these two things we are ruling out. And the next thing goes, some idea of the vascular territory map. You may not read too much of anatomy, but it is always nice if you know a little bit of the vascular territory map. So the posterior fossa, we have the, this is the medulla and this is the cerebellum. This is supplied by the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. The so-called, we have the lateral medullary syndrome and so on, so on and so forth. The perforating branches from the uh, vertebral and the basilar artery supply the medulla. You go a little higher, all this uh, yellow things, it is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. The red, the supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. So this is a frontal, the temporal, the, again, the cerebellum and the pons. You go a little higher, again, you can see the nicely, the lateral aspect supplied by the middle cerebral, the posterior aspects of the temporal supplied by the posterior cerebral artery, the medial aspects of the frontal supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. And then again, this is by the superior cerebellar artery. You go a little higher, the classical wedge of the middle cerebral artery on both sides here, the anterior cerebral artery. The posteriorly, you have got the posterior, the green is by the supply by the posterior cerebral artery. This is by the superior cerebellar artery. You go a little bit higher, again, at the level of the ventricular body, you can see the, again, the middle cerebral artery's territory, the anterior cerebral posterior cerebral in uh, green. So this is the topmost cut. You can see parasagittal, the anterior cerebral artery and the lateral middle cerebral artery. So if you have, it is very interesting because as technologists, if, if you have a little bit anatomy, you can almost straight away call and tell I've got an ACA infarct, uh, something needs to be done. So you, uh, uh, when you talk in such clinical terms, a lot of respect will come to the technologist because his appreciation of anatomy is very thorough. A lot of clinicians will start respecting. They give a lot of respect because they will believe whatever you tell. 
So this is, I'm giving a common established infarct. Like I told, no anterior cerebral artery, you see the parasagittal. This is a phallic cerebri. This hypodensity are parallel to the phallic, which is the ACA infarct. The MCA infarct, I told last uh, slides that yellow area. So this is the hypodensity MCA infarct. The posterior, posteriorly you see the occipital region, which is hypodense, it is a PCA infarct. And then cerebellar infarct, this is superior cerebellar artery infarct. Something that is also called border zone. Whenever two territories in the middle, if there is a hypodensity like wedge shape, that is a border zone here. The middle cerebral artery territory is here. The territory of the posterior cerebral is here. The middle, we have got the border zone infarct. There is again another in type of infarct, which is a very tiny infarct that is caused by the end arteries they are uh, infarcting. So this is a lacuna infarct. So these spectrum, you'll be seeing a lot of things you'll be seeing. Now, when you have an anatomical basis of the vascular territory and when you view it, it makes it always very easy for you. And also you feel very satisfied that we are you are even able to get into the pathophysiology of what is happening. So there are some rare stroke syndromes. I don't want to go into it. So in the rare stroke, um, uh, uh, rare stroke also, we have got the infarct here. So why the important uh, thing is that there is a time window for neuro intervention. So up to 4.5 hours, if the patient tells morning when I ate my breakfast at nine o'clock, I was all right. He comes to the hospital at 11 o'clock and he tells I'm not able to use my right hand or that under tells the patient is not able to use the right and the left hand. Then he has come right within the window. So if everything, all other parameters, there are some criteria. If those criteria are met, we can straight away give a IV tissue plasminogen activator, which will go and absolutely lyse the clot and the patient will become normal within half an hour. So that is the level of thrombolysis which is available today. There is another technique which we can extend. Again, when certain criteria are met, we can extend even up to 24 hours, some 16 to 24 hours we can extend. That is using a catheter and taking off the thrombus, which we call it mechanical disruption and thromboembolectomy. So that can also be done up to 24 hours from the time of onset of the symptoms. So this, so because everything should happen within the 24 hours, that's why prompt imaging is very much essential. So we categorize stroke as hyperacute early and late. Early hyperacute is less than six hours from the time of the uh, last normal known. And the late is six to 24 hours. The acute is up to seven days. And further uh, later than that, we classify it subacute and chronic. But all everything, the hyperacute is only the focus, the globally, everyone is focused on the hyperacute thing because not only it saves patients' lives, it also saves him from so much of disability and economic burden to the family. So as technologists, you even you can pick up the early stroke signs. So whenever you see something hyperdense along the course of the middle cerebral artery like this in a plain scan, you can think of a hyperdense MCA sign. So this is a hyperdense MCA sign. You see the previous one, we see the hyperdensity. When the, when the same patient, after doing an angiogram and 3D rendering, you can see the internal carotid artery, the right, uh, the left anterior cerebral, this middle cerebral artery is cut. On the right side, you can see the normal middle cerebral artery. So the left MCA is cut off here because of the hyperdense thrombus, which is called the hyperdense MCA sign. Then further along the course, you see the MCA, the middle cerebral artery course is like this. So further along the course, if you are seeing something like a hyperdense dot, it is called the MCA dot sign. You see how early on we can see simply a dot. Then after a few hours, we can see the whole thing is infarcted. The normal uh, um, brain is here. The abnormal brain, you can see the both the gray-white differentiation is lost and it has become a little bit more hypodense than the opposite side. So this is the in fact, which is developed a few hours after this MCA dot sign appeared. Then another thing, which is called the, this part of the brain, we call it as a, where the Sylvian Fisher subtense, this part, we call it as a insula. So sometimes the insula alone becomes hypodense. So as you know, in CT, anything which becomes edematous, it becomes hypodense because the 
Hounsfield value reduces. So anything in causes edema, the it becomes a dark. So this is a uh, again the uh, insular ribbon sign. It looks like a ribbon. So we call it as an insular ribbon sign. So you see the insular ribbon sign in another patient. You see the normal gray matter, but here you can see very subtly it is dark. We call it as the insular ribbon sign. So another sign is that so some there are some gray matter as you as I have told the gray matter in brain has got a higher Hounsfield value something like forty H U. White matter will have a twenty five hour H U. There are some central gray matter. This is a caudate nucleus, lentiform nucleus, and the thalamus. So they also have around 40 HU. So right side, it is absolutely normal. See, it is bright. But on the left side, it is starting to become dark. So this is called the obscuration of the lentiform nucleus. So this is another sign of a very early infarct, which can appear even within four hours or three hours of the infarcted brain. So that is the obscuration of the lentiform nucleus sign. So these are things which you can do it by uh, proper windowing of the brain tissue. So this is slightly later stage. You can see the classical wedge shape. Left side, it is normal. Right side, the hypodensity is there. The wedge shape is there. The sulcal effacement. So these are the sulci. You see the normal sulci. This is a normal sulci. The abnormally, you can see no sulcal is there because the brain becomes edematous. The wedge shape is there. The gray-white differentiation. Uh, normally, gray matter is slightly brighter. This gray-white differentiation is also lost. So this is another very subtle sign of a stroke. So the I, I want to emphasize to all technologists that in stroke, acute stroke, take some time to adjust the windows because when you adjust the windows, even small infants will be picked up. Here, after adjusting the windows, maybe in my monitor, it is not coming uh, a little bit better, but you can see the left lentiform nucleus is white and normal, whereas the right lentiform nucleus only half is seen. The posteriorly, it has become dark. In the normal windowing, it is just seen. You are, we are, there is a doubt whether this is there or not, but here when you adjust, it becomes dark and we can tell confidently that the right lentiform nucleus has become infarcted in the posterior part. So the radiologist, he, he has got a little quantitative approach to a middle cerebral artery uh, infarct. He tells it is aspect score. So what is the aspect score? There, is, there was one program in Canada, one study, Alberta Stroke Program Early CT Score. So the Alberta is a place in Canada. So Alberta Stroke Program, they started utilizing this early CT score. So that what you do is they divided the MCA territory into 10 areas. Okay, I told you, you know, one for the each uh, hemisphere, you have a caudate nucleus, one point, lentiform nucleus, one point, then internal capsule, one point, insula, one point, then the cortex and the uh, white matter, they divided into M1, M2, M3, the higher cut in the region of the ventricles, M4, M5, M6. So 10 parts and they wanted to give one, one mark for each. Okay. And then you need to just subtract from 10. What is the uh, total number of areas involved? So here in this patient, I have, you can easily tell that here there is a hypodensity. So this is gone. So M1 uh, is gone. Okay. So M1 is gone. And you see the insula, the normal insula is here. The insula is also gone. So two areas are gone. And the M4, the next cut, you see the M4 is also gone. So three areas have gone. So the rest are normal. So the aspect score can be given as 10 minus 3. So 10 points for each individual areas, minus 3, the 7. So this is a very ideal candidate who can go for thrombolysis, who can go for any of the interventions if there is a large vessel occlusion. So here, uh, next, the technology's role is if, if, the, if, you, if the patient tells, I had my, um, uh, I, had a, I was normal two hours back. Now I have got this problem and you find this hypodensity. Don't hesitate. You tell your uh, radiologist and start doing a CT angio. Because, but um, uh, but the, there are protocols in each individual hospital, but the CT angio at the same sitting without waiting for a blood urea creatine. So that is what the now the everywhere in the 
um, uh, global uh, stage they are telling don't there is no in an acute stroke brain is more important than the kidney the kidney even if it is deteriorating we can do some dialysis one or two the patient can come out but brain if you don't intervene is going to lose a lot of brain tissue so without waiting for a urea creatinine in acute stroke you go ahead and do a CT angio. There are various types of protocols, but everywhere you almost use about 60 to 70 here uh, in our institution of contrast. The rate of injection is around three to four ml per second. So you, you also use a saline chase and there are various types of acquisition. One acquisition from vertex to aortic arch, another type they tell you do it from C1 to vertex from, and then you do from aortic arch to C1. But the basic thing is you have to cover from the aortic arch to the vertex. Why? Because we want to see whether the common carotid, whether there is a narrowing at the origin of the common carotid, whether there is a narrowing at the origin of the vertebral artery itself. So that's why from the aortic arch to the vertex of the head, we need to cover. That will only give a very nice uh, neck and brain angio. Okay. So the next thing is, so in this patient, what has happened? You have done an angio, you see, this is the internal carotid artery and it's nicely seeing the right MCA. But what has happened to the left? The left MCA is not seen at all. And then distally some collateral it is filling. But this is absolutely blocked right from the origin of the left middle cerebral artery. This is one of the very ideal candidates we can go for neuro intervention. So uh, I told you know about CT perfusion imaging. In some centers, we have got the CT perfusion. It is not a must, but if it is there, it can be combined with a CT angiogram. What is the basis? Why we are doing CT perfusion means we are just assessing three things. What is the cerebral blood volume for that uh, penumbra? What is the cerebral blood flow? What is the mean transit time? All this can be found out by just plotting the graph. All this is done by the computer. The arterial curve, the venous curve is there. And from this, it can estimate at each place the cerebral blood volume. What is the flow per millimeter square of tissue? What is the volume per millimeter cube of tissue? And what is the mean transit time? Mean transit time means how much time the contrast takes to go from the arterial side to the venous side. So the, the MTT is a uh, equation of cerebral blood volume divided by cerebral blood flow. So this only three, these three things, if you know, perfusion imaging is nothing because finally it comes as a nice graph like this. Okay, but, uh, but this is just a schematic one. So what happens in, a, in an infarct core? So this we cannot save at all here because both the blood volume and the blood flow are absolutely very less. We cannot save this, but a large area around this, which we call the penumbra, we can absolutely save because here the blood flow is decreased, but the blood volume is still normal. And then this can be saved if you either do a thrombolysis or you do a mechanical thrombectomy. So this is the nice map which you get. So briefly, I will tell you the cerebral blood, this is the penumbra and this is the irre irreversibly infected core. So this can be uh, salvaged and saved. This cannot be saved. So the cerebral blood volume you see on the left and the right, almost the right side is almost normal. Whereas the flow, it is definitely decreased in the penumbra. So, and then the mean transit time is increased in the penumbra. So this is the map which the computer will give you. And then you, you can definitely tell the radiologist that, sir, the cerebral blood volume is retained, the flow is decreased, the mean transit time is increased, you can definitely go for a neuro intervention. So the simplified stroke management protocol, if 4.5 hours the patient comes within the stroke onset, the aspects criteria, I told you, you know, seven after 10 and more, and there is a penumbra, you give IV thrombolysis, the patient will dramatically recover. If there is an associated large vessel occlusion, in the, in the sense that either internal carotid, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral or posterior cerebral or the basilar artery is occluded and the patient is within 24 hours of stroke onset, we can go to the cath lab and do a mechanical endovascular thrombectomy.
So what they do in a mechanical endovascular thrombectomy, they put a catheter and then they put a stent and catch the clot in the stent and remove it slowly. So this is endovascular. If for experienced person, it takes only 20 minutes to go and retrieve the clot in straightforward cases. Such is the advancements in the hardware, such is the advancements in the cath lab, in the biplane cath lab, that for a reasonably experienced person, it takes only 20 minutes from the puncture right down to retrieve this clot. So this is a close-up, you can see the stent retriever. You can see the clot here, the st stent is deployed and then the stent we are um, uh, inflating and then here it catches the uh, thrombus and you can slowly uh, remove the thrombus. So this is another thing called thrombosuction, where just by applying suction with an equipment, we can suck out the thrombus. So this is, sometimes you can have a balloon at the distal end to prevent it from going forwards so you can have a thrombosuction is also another equipment which can be used to just suck out the thrombus. This is a case which is illustrated here. You see an acute occlusion of the left middle cerebral artery M1, M2 segments. The angiogram shows there's absolutely no flow. And then here the diffusion in this patient, they have done a diffusion. This, I call it the core infarct. So this, you cannot do anything. It is already dead. But what we are trying to do is we are trying to save the brain which is outside this area. The, this the whole brain here, this is what we are trying to save by going in with a catheter and then sucking out our thrombic, mechanical thrombectomy which is done and opening up the middle cerebral artery and you see the wonderful blood flow which is established. The patient can walk home within one or two days with absolutely very, very, very minimal neurological sequelae. Otherwise, he will not even be able to talk for many years, let alone walk. So what is the future course of the stroke imaging? The future, very soon, it has actually happened abroad. It has happened in US. It is happening in many places in Europe. The diagnosis part may be taken away by an app and artificial intelligence. So everything depends on the technologies. You need to do high quality scans. Um, you, should, you need to correct the obliquity. You need to put the patient in proper position. And then you need to do a proper brain and CT angios without movement and with a proper concentration of the contrast, the trigger and everything, you know, the saline chase, all should be paka. And then you need to feed the images into an app. So the radiologists slowly and slowly they will have to do into their have to go into the intervention aspect because what has now happened and is now accepted is that AI has taken over, especially in US, around 1,800 hospitals in US and Europe, they are using this artificial intelligence called rapid AI. So they are using it to diagnose acute stroke. In fact, the studies, the 14 clinical trials, it has validated the use and the uh, FDA has also approved it. And it is one another important thing is it has to, uh, the, the trial has told that it's more accurate than a radiologist, than an experienced radiologist sitting there and interpreting. Why? Because it is a little bit subjective. I told you, you know, the adjusting the windows and picking up is a lot of subjective, but the computer does a lot of quantitative analysis as you see in the next stage. So this is how the rapid AI they do for intracranial hemorrhage aspect scoring i told that they're doing the ct angio we have got a module large vessel occlusion we have a module ct perfusion ct mi a rapid mri everything there is a module to do that so here so this one a radiologist will you sit and tell maybe aspects of say eight or six there will be a lot of subjective variations because he has to accurately adjust the windows and compare he's not doing much measurement but the computer, what it does, it fragments, it segments all the say, well, this is the caudate nucleus, internal capsule, lentiform nucleus, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6. It segments, it calculates the average of the Hounsfield value. And very nicely, it tells the difference between this is four or five Hounsfield units from the right and the left, from the normal, from the abnormal. It gives it in red. And finally, it gives a score, aspect score seven, all within a matter of, seconds so a radiologist coming there and reporting is it's almost taken over by the 
app, which is a rapid artificial intelligence app. And then it is also does when you feed it with the, all the angiogram pictures, it rapidly gets a 3D view and then it tells that the left MCA is gone. And this is beamed into the app which the interventional radiologist is having in this mobile phone. And within, uh, within seconds, the interventional radiologist also sees the um, large vessel occlusion in the CT angiogram. So this is how in US, stroke has been revolutionized by incorporating artificial intelligence in the diagnostic armamentarium. And it is going at such a fast pace that right now we are only limited by the patient arriving late. Otherwise, the system is geared to give an early imaging, early intervention and early recovery for the stroke patient. But right now in India, getting the artificial intelligence app is costly. And so we are relying on the human intelligence, the intelligence of the technologists and the intelligence of the radiologist. In CMCH, what we have done is we have tried to give a small reporting sheet which incorporates the angiogram and the aspects. And I made it very easy to remember an ASTRA report, Acute Stroke Tomographic Rapid Assessment Report. So this report is like a small tabular column like here. This is what we have evolved in Coimbra Medical College. The one, the aspect scoring, the CT angiogram. So you have the anterior circulation aspect scoring and the same we have got the CT angiogram here of all the arteries here. And then that is another aspect scoring for the posterior circulation that I have not touched upon. But here in our format, we have got the uh, posterior circulation aspects and the posterior circulation CT angiogram, the vertebral, uh, basilar, posterior circular artery. And then the radiologist, uh, um, uh, marks which artery is blocked. He also gives a pictorial thing. All this happens within five to 10 minutes of reading the scan. And then this is given or photographed and taken and given to the um, emergency physician there. So this report format we have evolved for acute stroke in Coimbatore Medical College Hospital. So what are the components of the stroke pre program we are running is Definitely, there should be pre-intimation. So why the pre-intimation is important? Because this worldwide, the time they have told us, whenever a stroke patient comes to the emergency department, whenever an acute stroke, within 25 minutes, the CT scan should be over. No time should be wasted. So this is possible only if from the emergency, they call the CT scan department, tell uh, we have got a stroke. So the technician should immediately prepare everything. If there is an elective patient, you can ask them to wait. We have, if there's an elective abdomen, it may take time. So you should tell the patient, wait, we have got an emergency. So as soon as a patient comes, we have, we'll, we have to do a quick uh, non enhanced CT imaging. If the time frame is within the four hours and hemorrhage ruled out, we have to give. Actually, what happens in abroad, the emergency staff nurse also comes. And once that aspect is favorable, they give a IV thrombolysis, the um, recombinant tissue plasminogen activator on table at the CT scan uh, gantry itself as we are preparing to do a CT angiogram. So we are going to put a broad um, cath. So when we are doing that, we give the, uh, so the treatment starts at the CT room everywhere abroad. So after that, you do a CT angiogram. Here in Coimbatore, we give the Dastra report. And if you see a large vessel occlusion, like I told, proximal MCA, proximal ACA, proximal PCA. We alert the intervention team consisting of the interventional radiologists right now. We are calling interventional radiologists from one of the corporate hospitals to assist us. We have got a cath lab staff and the neuro intensivist. So these are the people who are alerted and we need to uh, decide whether it is uh, worthwhile to do a immediate intervention and thromb thrombus extraction. So what are the current challenges which we are facing? Main thing is pre-intimation. So the sometimes pre-intimation does not come. The patient comes and waits outside along with the attender who is illiterate. And we don't know for what for is waiting in a stretcher. So when we come out after 10 minutes, 10 minutes is wasted. So those are the pre-intimation requests which we need to get from the emergency department. And then definitely within 25 minutes of presentation to the emergency department, the CT scan plane should be done. 
and then you have to correct the positional obliquity because more very oblique things the computer may give an erroneous report so the obliquity i have to correct even though modern uh, ct scanners we can correct the positional obliquity it is always better when you position that it is not oblique and then definitely the narrowing of windows has to be done with the technology is to give a very good film which shows the infarct in all its correctness and a proptim and an optimal ct angiogram study so you should give a very good ct angiogram study show the image reconstruction in various modes and then the 3d rendering also if you have a mri nearby it's worthwhile and if the neurologist asks or the trauma ward uh, emergency physician asks you can incorporate diffusion wave imaging and you can in incorporate ct perfusion but right now it is not a must many 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 uh, places because of this there might be delays so we should uh, there is no need right now we can just go ahead with a plain ct and a ct angiogram to give very optimal results for the patient so again this international day of radiology i chose a topic which is related to um, intervention because the theme is interventional radiology active care for the patient and for the same while for the same reason we also last week conducted a interventional radiology cme at uh, our hospital and for which Dr. Matthew Cherian, Dr. Anbarasu and our dean had come and we had five interventional radiologists speaking. So interventional radiology is a future and I may be a little bit cynical or skeptical, but diagnostic radiology is slowly and slowly going out of our hands. Uh, in per perhaps in 30 years, we will have a great technologist doing the scan and the interventional radiologist at the cath lab and the diagnostic part being taken over largely by computers and artificial intelligence so with